Welcome back to The Torch. I'm Paul DiRienzo, and this is your weekly look into the uh, both the lighter side and the darker side of life and the different things that you might not have known that have happened in the last week that we can tell you and hopefully inform you towards the purpose of, uh, of making the type of basic social change that we're looking for, that, that thinking and feeling people who have critical thought and critical mind are looking for. Uh, we're going to, as I said earlier, we will attempt to find the underlying currents that define our times that define our times and pull on the threads that unravel the actual facts. Uh, we, are, we have a program here that will rigorously search for the provable, verifiable truth as it exists. And we live in a world that is getting smaller every day. We have no room for walls but wish to bring, build bridges. And this program will strive to find the connections that link our 7.5 billion people and will fight mercilessly against ideologies that would divide and set people against each other. And I welcome listeners to participate by tweeting at Let Them Talk 2, L E T T H E M T A L K 2, number 2. And um, we will now move forward to our next guest, uh, Stanley Cohen, an attorney, an activist, a uh, representative, a diplomat, a citizen's diplomat, a peacemaker. Um, welcome very much to our uh, – you're the second guest of our first episode of our new program here on the Progressive Radio Network, The Torch. And I uh, welcome you to our, uh, to our uh, living room. Thank you very much, Staley Cohen. Thanks, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you and the opening of this uh, much-needed and uh, wonderfully welcomed uh, grand new show. Thanks a lot. Uh, Stanley, we've known each other a long time, and uh, you've worked on a lot of issues. Uh, we met you were working to help homeless people and people who were trying to make lives for themselves in the then-abandoned buildings of the then-forgotten uh, backwaters called the Lower East Side, now called by landlords the East Village, and where uh, rents, uh, when you compare it to those days, are outrageous and through the roof, but we did see it coming. Um, then we went on to uh, you went on to work and to represent the Mohawk a warrior society uh, in their confrontation, Oka, Quebec, where I had the opportunity with our good friend John to uh, come up and visit you and to uh, to see what it was like to be in a uh, with Native Americans as must be as people must be feeling right now in uh, in North Dakota, surrounded by the armed force of the state, tanks and men with machine guns and airplanes and rockets being fired and you know the terror that and the courage of the people who would uh, exist in a circumstance like that to to fight for their rights and and what sometimes we're forced to do to fight for our rights um and uh, I learned a lot from those experiences with you Stanley and uh, to go forward you began working with the uh, uh Palestinian Authority and you beca- came to represent Yasser Arafat as his attorney and and then later no, on no, no, let me correct you not the PA I've never worked with the PA I, I represented Hamas Paul. You were okay you represented Hamas then okay for some reason I thought you were uh, actually representing it in some situation Yasser Arafat but you stayed with well, Hamas Well no Arafat uh, Abu Omar had asked on a number of occasions for my you know, to, to consult with me around issues that were uh, important at the time, but um, I have represented uh, Hamas from 1995 on when I successfully represented the then leader of, of uh, the political wing, Musa Abu Marzouk. I see. Now, uh, right, and that, there was the famous case of Mr. Marzouk. Also, uh, these are cases that relay, uh, I mean, they're refugee cases in many ways, it seems, because people are you, often fleeing from one jurisdiction to another and finding it difficult to get through or to get back after they do that. And uh, it seems that crossing a, a border in this world can be a very complex endeavor when the countries are in hostility and hostile circumstances. Um, could you tell us a little bit about... Um, you know your background and how you got to do this work and why you do this work. Before we go into a more broader discussion about about the current situation, I just want to establish with our listeners uh, your expertise in this matter and how you came. Sure. To it. Well, look, I, I was a, a student activist in the anti-war movement in the late '60s and early '70s at Long Island University and other universities throughout the United States. I was arrested a number of times, including the March in the Pentagon. Uh, I, I was involved in the civil rights movement. I was involved in the early days of, of, the, of uh, the Fort Greene Youth Patrol, which then later became the Black Panther Party in Fort Greene, where I lived when I went to Long Island University. After leaving uh, Long Island University, being asked to leave, <laughs> mm-hmm. I subsequently graduated from another school 
then became a VISTA volunteer, the domestic alternative to the Peace Corps, where I lived and worked with the Winnebago, Omaha, and Santee Sioux Indian Nations in South Dakota and Nebraska, setting up a legal services project. I returned and got involved with community organizing, uh, was a director of a large anti-poverty agency, uh, and from there uh, morphed off in my late 20s to go to law school. Um, after law school, I, the only job I applied for was a position with the Criminal Defense Division of Legal Aid Society in the South Bronx, where I worked for six years, uh, defending a lot of low profiles and high profile clients, including uh, the, the famous now deceased Larry Davis. Upon leaving legal aid, I became de facto law partners with Lynn Stewart, and having come from a you know, personal activist political career dating back to when I was 16. You know, uh, here I was in my mid-30s and opening a, a law practice of my own. And, you know, for over 30 years, it's focused uh, largely on political rights domestically and internationally. I've uh, done a lot of work in uh, international law. I've handled cases in the International Criminal Court, uh, in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, sued Egypt and the African Union and the uh, Union of Political and Social Rights and Human Rights. Uh, you know, I've spent most of the last 30 years plus involved largely in human rights and justice and political cases, both domestically and internationally. Mm -hmm. And and so, do you find that um, you've been embraced here in your own country in the United States for this work? I mean, working on behalf of the poor, working on behalf of, of, of refugees, of oppressed peoples, oppressed minorities. Is this something that, that you proudly put on your, your resume in the sense of this will get you another job or never get you a job again? I mean, why, how do people well, think about somebody like you? There's a double standard, and I like to use the example of Israel as proof of that, the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Years ago, when I was doing pro bono work, and you know, probably 50, 60 percent of my cases, which have gone all the way up to include PayPal 14, the anonymous movement, mm -hmm. you know, well, Occupy Wall Street, Black Bloc, you know, squatters, most of it's 50 percent or more, 60 percent has been, you know, pro bono work. So years ago, when I was doing uh, Tompkins Square Park and 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 uh, you know homeless shelters and food kitchens uh, and doing all this you know the, the, all the all the work that they 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 love to put me on the front page of Israeli newspapers as examples of Jews sharing and being progressive and helpful to those in need and you know now it's become oh the, the self hating Jew the terrorist the lawyer the mouthpiece for the lawyer uh, the crazy man. Um, the reality of it is we live in a system, in a time, and in a country in which we like to exploit these neoliberal notions of concern and care for one another. And the late great community organizer Saul Alinsky, in describing and defining a liberal, said that a liberal is one who puts their foot down, his or her foot down, in righteous indignation in thin air. So we very much in this country love those people, lawyers, activists, doctors, artists, teachers, you know, community organizers that mm -hmm. do work that is necessary and important but doesn't necessarily challenge the core foundation of a system built upon race, class, and politics. And when you cross the line and you begin to challenge the institutional structure, all of a sudden you become not just a revolutionary but an enemy, but a criminal, an evil person, and they target you. They come for you in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, some people, many people have lost their lives in doing this kind of work, many others have lost their freedom. Many others have lost their ability to maintain families and income. But it comes with the turf. So as long as you are a, quote, liberal that does work, which provides a service, and I'm not trivializing it, that helps the homeless, the hungry, the poor, those unable to represent themselves, you're looked at, you're, you're, you're sort of packaged to, to represent what America is about, the good side of America. But when you confront the systemic racism and classism and political bias and ugly side of America, both domestically and internationally as a neocolonial or as a colonialist power, then you become an enemy of the state, and then you are targeted, and they come for you. And that runs a, a, a full range, a full course, uh, but, you know, it, it comes with the turf. Would you do anything differently in your life? No. You've done everything? No, you I, everything. 
You, you're, no. That's good to hear. I'm glad to hear it, uh, Stanley Cohen, uh, because you've dedicated your life to such great work. And let's talk about your work with Hamas, because Hamas is often, uh, you know, it's called a terrorist organization, uh, uh, axis of evil. It's been attacked at all different levels. Uh, it's, uh, in Israel, a dirty word. I mean, what brought you, uh, don't you think that uh, representing Islamic fundamentalism, as our president might refer to it, or worse, uh, is uh, is endangering your Americans, endangering Israelis? What, what do you think? Say to those Listen, that, Hamas is a national liberation movement. Hezbollah is a national liberation movement. There are movements throughout the world. Um, um, it's interesting when the United States looked the other direction and helped to organize al-Qaeda, or the, the, the precursor to al-Qaeda to go and fight against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They were heroes. When the United States helped to organize the Kosovo Liberation Army, in which I was involved in that effort, in, in, in Arthur Avenue and throughout the United States to send them to do secret bidding for Clinton before the bombings began, they were heroes. Look, Hamas is a national liberation movement. They are recognized in their country as the elected representatives of, of a majority of one of the most transparent, open, and widely participated election in the Middle East when they were voted uh, into office in, in 2006. Uh, they are engaged in armed struggle. But for Hamas, uh, what little is left of the West Bank and all of Gaza would right now be a theme park with the tour guides being the Palestinian Authority. I have represented uh, Suleiman Abu Ghaith, who was Osama bin Laden's son-in-law, uh, in a very high-profile case in the Southern District of New York. I've represented individuals that are involved in activities that the government calls terrorist and tens, hundreds of millions of people describe as revolutionary and lawful. Under international law, the right to armed struggle, the right to self-determination is recognized. Uh, Hamas is considered and recognized as a as a, as a national liberation movement by most of the sophisticated and mature world. I could care less what Israel thinks. I could care less what the United States thinks. Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, I, 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 I will stand with, with, with resistance, which covers a wide range of activity, which can range from armed struggle to poetry, to organizing, to letter writing, to, 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 to strikes to uh, kids with masks and stones throwing rocks to hunger strikes. Mm -hmm. So, look, I, I have probably in the last 20 years in particular spent half my life overseas in war zones and zones where there's national liberation and struggles underway. I've gotten to know leaders of these movements, participants in these movements. Um, these are wonderful people. These are people that are fighting on behalf of their own people, their own destiny, their own rights, and in accord with international law. You know, the Hasbara of Israel or the United States, the propaganda machine, which works around the clock to try to recast with one broad brush this notion of Islamist fundamentalism. And I still don't know what that means. You know, there's 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. And the last time I checked, there have been more Americans killed by cops or by white Christian militiamen, or, or, or just crazy white Christian boys, largely in the United States, than Muslims. So you don't see a cultural um, war. I mean, that's what, when you talk to people, I mean, all those things are correct. And if you push the supporters of the, our dear president and his uh, backers like Steve uh, Bannon to the wall, they're going to tell you that um, you, everything you say might be true, but who cares? It's a, this is a God-foreseen war between cultures. Well, that's fine. If, if this is to be a clash of culture, ultimately, in any, in any clash, whether it's culture um, or in any revolutionary struggle, at the end of the day, I am one person who believes that, that in the marketplace of ideas, in the marketplace of exchange, the truth will always rise. So if they view this as a clash of culture, then those people that occupy the White House and the inner circle of the White House, the billionaires, the gazillionaires, and the generals, are destined to lose because this this they they represent the darkness the falsehood the manipulation um um, um the anecdotal signpost of growing national socialism throughout the world the u.s is no different and they're going to lose national now, so socialism costly, being fascism fascism you say of saying. course or nazi of national course. socialism is nazi i mean we see the <laughs> The, 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 the move in France where a, the, the far right under Pena is, is, is taking the lead, where she and Trump and, and, and Putin 
and other fascist movements and leaders worldwide are now developing. You know, I, I posted something on Twitter today that said, look, it's, you know, it seems once a century the National Socialist Movement rears its ugly head under various flags, and this time the lead is in red, white, and blue. Um, so they can, they can try to recast this in any light they want. You know, the irony of this is the war in Islam, if you get to the bottom line of Muslims and Islam, there is not a more conservative group of law-abiding, family-oriented, hard-working group in the world. And there are people engaged that run the gamut from armed struggle to acts of terrorism, most of them carried out by the United States and Israel throughout the world today. But there are 1.8 billion, one out of every, what, four or five people in the world is a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Now, if the Trumps and the Bannons and the David Dukes and the Ku Klux Klan and the other neo-Nazis in the United States and Europe Michael Flynn. want to go to war against 1.8 billion people, they're going to lose. Right. Uh, I wouldn't put anything past our current president. He seems so unpredictable, and uh, who knows what the wrong uh, Saturday Night Live uh, opening monologue might drive him to in the next few weeks. So uh, I, I, I find we're in very dangerous times in that respect. Uh, we really don't know. I don't think the people in control really know what they're going to do next. I've well, been... you know, the interesting... I'm yeah, sorry. go ahead. No, go ahead. The interesting thing is there was an article in the Washington Post today, which the bottom line is doesn't suggest it comes out and says that, look, Trump claims that there have been acts of terrorism that the media has covered up, in particular in the United States. See, that's what he's suggesting as part of this you know, pushback against the Ninth Circuit challenge. And, you know, so I posted on Twitter a couple of hours ago, and it's, it's going viral, it seems. I said, you know, actually the White House was destroyed 17 months ago in a terrorist attack, and the media covered it up. And there was the Bowling Green massacre. Oh, yeah. And the yeah, false Bowling. flag where all those children were killed. Uh, it wasn't gun control. It was a, a gun sold to a madman. It was, um, it was a, a false flag operation. Yeah, like Columbine, just, or one of those places in Connecticut. I, I don't know. There's a conspiracy theory along those lines that have been pushed by some of these very same people, uh, um, Alex Jones and uh, uh, Michael Ledeen, and who's back from those Ron Contra days to be an advisor now to Michael Flynn, who's uh, going to be head of the National Security Agency. And uh, uh, we have uh, Steve Bannon, closest advisor to the president, who uh, owned a uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, a blog. I won't even say the name of it. I don't want to give it any promotion. Um, what does the future hold? Are we going to? Are we planning for a war in the Middle East? I mean, many people. The president, the former president of uh, our last, the last leader of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev himself, has said that he sees the all the signs seem to be leading to not just a small war, but a very large war. Well, the reality of it is. Barack Obama was the only president in American history who was at war every single day of two terms. We have been at war nonstop for decades in the Middle East and elsewhere. It is the last gasp by colonial empires using proxies at times and themselves at other times to try to hold on to a developing area of the world. Um, I ultimately don't believe, as people have suggested, that there will be the you know the confrontation between the between Russia and the United States directly because war has evolved into basically a, a color and class based confrontation. I don't see white women and men fighting white women and men, whether their names are are Vladimir or or or, or Trump. Um, I, I do think that that you know, more and more people in Africa and, and the Gulf and, and, and the Middle East obviously are involved in and expressing themselves through a number of means to for self-determination, for freedom, to rid themselves once and for all of the control of the West, uh, and the West is going to fight. And, you know, they may they may create a landscape, sculpt a landscape built upon a mountain of lies, which Donald Trump is expert at. Mm -hmm. um, reality is just for those people who can't lie and move on. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, I I am actually. Despite the darkness, I'm, I'm act, actually, in a strange sort of way, relieved in the sense that we're just so used to the surreptitious and the, you know, the Republican mm -hmm. or Democratic, you know, the institutional sort of hatred and battle and the, and the pretext, the weapons of mass destruction, and and you know, the enemies that we've had to deal with, whether it's through Bush or Obama or Clinton or any of these guys, that we now have an absolute stark raving lunatic 
who doesn't hide anything. In fact, he not only throws everything out on the table, he just makes up insanity to suit his political mm-hmm. agenda. Are you hardened? Uh, Stanley Cohen joining us, attorney, uh, representative of uh, of Hamas, uh, attorney for the leaders of Hamas, uh, a long history of work in uh, uh, for people of color and people, oppressed peoples around the world and in the United States and you're here in New York City where we originated our broadcast from on the Progressive Radio Network. I'm Paul Durienzo. This is The Torch, a uh, new program we're going to be hearing every week with interviews like we're hearing now where we're going to really get down to the, to the questions of the day and uh, follow the truth wherever it might take us. Uh, Stanley Cohen, I wanted to come back to the Israel-Palestinian circumstance and ask you mm-hmm. about what you think. Uh, right now we have... Those who see, it seems, on the Netanyahu side who see this sort of greater Israel and, and, and Iran as this existential enemy to be uh, fought, I guess, with the help of the United States, uh, Israel gets 50 percent of all American military aid, more than every other country in the world combined. Uh, mm-hmm. It is uh, it's just a, a new book has just come out that uh, illustrates this tremendous military potential, the modern military potential of Israel and its armaments industries among the largest in the world. Um, so here we have uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu talking about this greater Israel in which Gaza and the West Bank uh, become absorbed into Israel, and I imagine the Palestinians who live there are driven out. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the Democratic Party, the more liberal, the Peace Now approach, which is this two-state theory that somehow you'll be mm-hmm. able to have these two, this sort of rump states called Gaza and the West Bank or Palestinian Authority without any true access to the sea, and all their ports uh, can be turned on and turned off according to the whim of even a liberal government. So um, are those the only two opposition, the only two no. positions? No. Is there something no. else? I, yeah, I've been a supporter uh, and interestingly enough, increasing numbers of Israelis, and not just from the left, perhaps even the hard right, certainly some of the settler movement, um, have begun to view the only resolution as either a one-state or a binational state resolution. Uh, perhaps the binational state based upon the model of Switzerland, uh, where there are in essence cantons or regions uh, where one group or one language, one culture, one tradition is stronger than another, but where ultimately it's one person, one vote. Uh, there is no formal uh, religion uh, for the state. Jerusalem would be the capital. There would be no um, guideposts. There would be no divisions, no walls, no checkpoints. Um, I think ultimately, uh, with changing demographics, uh, with more and more resistance, with a growing powerful boycott, divest, and sanction movement with Europe, uh, in some places, beginning to move increasingly against uh, Israeli genocide, Israeli ethnic cleansing, and with more and more Israelis reaching the point. You know, we hear about the hard right, the settler lunacy. Um, and I wrote a piece recently in Al Jazeera uh, that's called, it's not about settlements, and, and another one most recently that said, you know, end the charade, move, 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 move the embassy. Increasing numbers of Israelis are coming to grips with the fact that the walls and the checkpoints and the divisions and the military society that has evolved is making them every bit as captive as it is mm-hmm. being, uh, becoming an occupation force and apartheid and ethnic cleansing the Palestinians. Now, I'm not going to compare the relative pain quotients, because from a practical standpoint, I think increasing numbers of Israelis, particularly younger Israelis, are beginning to recognize that, um, that, that it, this can't continue that apartheid and occupation and ethnic cleansing cannot last in perpetuity. Uh, through one stream or another, it's occurred for 68 years. Um, it's, 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 not, it's, it's happened in the view of the world. The notion that somehow Israel is going to overnight um, move uh, some four, four and a half million Palestinian Arabs, including those they call Arab citizens or Israeli Arabs that have second and third class status out of either Gaza or what's left of the West Bank or Israel proper is not going to happen. Although it seems and, very eerily similar to what Donald Trump was saying about building his wall and forcing all the people. Yeah, well, 11 the million problem with that is, is you know, Israel and Palestine are extraordinarily small areas. You know, when you take a look at it and you tell people the entire Middle East basically fits into New England. So the notion that you are going to wall off millions and millions and millions of people and out of sight, out of mind, just doesn't happen in Israel. The checkpoints, the walls, the roadblocks, 
uh, the battle, the fights, the, 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 everything that, that, that takes place in Israel is very public. It touches everyone. In Palestine, certainly due to occupation and ethnic cleansing. Um, so unlike, and I'm not, unlike the silliness, the inane, you know, the, the, the lack of practicality and forget about humanity and international law of a war between Mexico and the United States, which would basically not be seen by 99.9% of everyone in America, um, 99.9% of everyone, forget about Palestinians just for a moment, I'm talking about the selfishness of Israelis themselves. Every 99.9% of every Israeli, every day of the week, even in wonderful Tel Aviv, with its clubs and its spots and its dances, feels, tastes, touches oppression, not that they're on the receiving end, but the giving end. It is becoming increasingly, as South Africa did toward the end, uh, the Bantu stands uh, are as much now in what is considered Israel as they are in Palestine, and I suspect that it's reached a point, and you have to also understand that there are more Jews in the United States than there are in Israel, and increasing numbers of Jews in the United States are no longer giving Israel the, the blank check, are no longer serving as full apologists for Israeli violation of international law. And I suspect that as more and more American Jews say not in our name, the ability of Israel to look down the road and think that they're going to go on as they have for much longer is silliness. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the the uh, divestment, the boycott and divestment movement that's developing against Israel here in the United States and Europe where people are boycotting and divesting from Israeli companies? And uh, and relate that to, in your opinion, if you've been following uh, this guy David Horowitz and his attacks on uh, on professors and academics and people like yourself uh, for holding the positions you do, especially if they're Jewish themselves. Well, you know, it's interesting because I also wrote a piece for Al Jazeera that went very viral. There's been almost 6 million hits. It's called BDS is a War That Israel Can't Win. You know, I find it interesting. On the one hand, Israel you know, shrugs BDS off, as do the Zionists in America, as do the lunatics like Horowitz, and say it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't touch us. But on the other hand, Israel is spending tens of millions, perhaps even more, if you don't know the full depth of, 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 of their spending in this area, to push back, to fight back. It's creating environments of academic intimidation, trying to fire faculty, shutting down the voices, trying to, you know, Fordham University most recently uh, would not permit the designation of a, of, of a pro-Palestinian student group on campus. Mm -hmm. So the notion that somehow, on the one hand, it's, it's meaningless, it's not having an impact, it's not having an effect, but yet on the other hand, Israel is spending hundreds, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars, and you have the ilk like Horwitz and Dershowitz spending all of this time and energy uh, trying to push back against BDS says to me it's successful. All right. Increasing, not a day goes by where there isn't a union, a trade union, a business, a company, a a collection, a collective internationally of folks that don't join BDS. Mm -hmm. It's now 10 years. It's very successful. It will continue to grow. And as I've said for years, the nature and extent and, and the positions of the resistance on the ground in Palestine is a decision left uniquely in the hands of Palestinians. Thank you when very much, Stanley Cohen. I think we have to end it here and pick this up another time. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, Stanley Cohen, talking about his experiences as an activist uh, on the Palestinian-Israeli issue. I'm Paul Durienzo, and you've been listening to The Torch. I'm your host, and I'll be here every week, and we'll see you on the radio this time next week on the, here on the Progressive Radio Network, P, network prn.fm. Comments and questions should be tweeted to at let them talk to at L E T T H E M T A L K number two. Let them talk to, and we'll be seeing you on the radio next week. <laughs>